floor is yours. Thank you. So thanks for inviting. And uh, I hope um, this talk gives some useful information even for the remote sensing um, uh, domain. Uh, and uh, maybe I first uh, just tell a little bit about my background. So I did my master's uh, degree in the University of Tartu. There, my supervisor was Jan Belt, who is also listening today here. He introduced me to time series analysis. Uh, I got very much interested in it. Uh, and uh, then my thesis was about uh, double quasar uh, microlensing. Uh, the time delay effect estimation in the double quasar <laughs> uh, microlensing effect, yeah, if I remember correctly. And uh, later I had an um, opportunity to uh, continue. This was much many years later uh, because I worked in the industry meanwhile. But uh, yeah, then I got an um, opportunity to continue with PhD studies in the Aalto University in Helsinki. And there also, Jan was one of my supervisors and uh, second supervisor or, or primary supervisor was uh, Marit Kabula, who is now the leader of astroinformatics uh, group in the same institute. And there I also primarily worked on time series uh, analysis, especially period and cycle length estimation of, of magnetically active stars. So the topic is not very far from solar physics, but uh, later I started, uh, I, I got more interested in other um, applications of machine learning in solar physics. And, uh, and now I'm postdoc in, um, in uh, Max Planck Institute uh, for solar system research here in Göttingen, Germany. And uh, my primary goal is here to find optimization methods for ground-based solar uh, image restoration. And, and for that, uh, neural networks and deep learning are very promising uh, tools. But so let's go to the talk now. So first, very shortly about machine learning in general, then I give you some examples from the literature of uh, some of the applications in solar physics and, and later then in more detail about uh, this particular uh, study I'm working on. So yes, very, very shortly. So machine learning methods uh, generally, they are divided into three categories. So first category, the most used one is supervised learning where you have the target labels or outputs or, or so to say ground truth is known. So you have, let's say, cats and dogs and you want to uh, learn a decision boundary between these, let's say using neural network or, or whatever other uh, tool. And, uh, and uh, second, uh, method is unsupervised learning, which then um, doesn't uh, rely on any any labeling of the data, so it's purely data driven. But of course, uh, it must rely on certain model assumptions. For instance, if, if you do clustering, then you you have let's, let's say assumptions of Gaussianity or or something else. It's uh, so so you never have. Um, zero assumptions. And the third category, which I won't be touching in this seminar at all, is uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, this is also very popular nowadays, especially in, uh, in self-driving cars and, and so forth. And um, it is usually also, uh, it is reduced usually to supervised learning. Uh, uh, but here, here the goal basically is to make the agent learn the optimal policy so that it can act in the environment uh, in the best possible way. 
So my this kind of general view is that uh, first any problem you have, you should uh, approach, try to approach it in a probabilistic uh, way because this is a then you have uh, quite solid tools and you know the limitations of of your method or what are you planning to do and and there just to mention one thing a very powerful tool is Gaussian processes uh, which usually needs lots of um, optimizations uh, added to it to make it scalable but yeah it's it's worth looking into it if uh, people are not familiar with this um, this method and uh, yeah the, the goal in the probabilistic machine learning is uh, to learn the full posteriors of the parameters of interest so here in the left plot i have shown a nice um, result from one of my colleagues study published this year where where it's shown this uh, two dimensional marginal distributions of uh, different regression parameters uh, which were used in uh, fitting into the uh, certain data of active stars but uh, but yeah so this is usually done using Markov chain more than Carlo but it is it is very slow if you especially if you have big data and uh, if you have huge number of parameters which is usually the case with the neural networks for instance uh, also so in practice it's, it's often not feasible so you just do some optimization to find the, the mean or mode of the distribution and then you use different gradient descent methods and uh, basically neural networks do the same thing they are very efficient ways of finding uh, unknown or complicated uh, dependency, dependencies uh, with, between different uh, variables. And now I go to the literature review, so to say, I, I show in more detail, not in very big detail, but uh, somewhat uh, more closely four studies then Besides that, there are uh, uh, three other interesting studies which I just comment uh, quickly here. So, uh, I mean, not the studies, but the research uh, areas. So, one of them is, uh, of course, predicting the long term solar activity, like uh, uh, how active is the next cycle and so forth. So, this kind of time series prediction based on uh, sunspot number data then people are interested in uh, inversions of of stokes profiles to to obtain uh, physical parameters in the solar atmosphere so th there are uh, different available uh, tools for doing that but uh, if you have done it once with uh, with these tools then you can always uh, apply deep learning again to to try to boost the performance so uh, people have also tried it out and then this uh, very interesting uh, study which uh, basically uh, trans transfers uh, or, or uh, converts uh, historical sunspot uh, hand drawings to realistic images or uh, magnetograms and this is uh, achieved using you achieved using this so-called uh, generative adversarial networks uh, this is also very popular in uh, in uh, different uh, fields uh, especially involving uh, images like uh, face photos uh, and so forth generating artificial uh, human faces for instance and uh, then uh, I mentioned a little bit about this uh, study, my future study using Gaussian processes. The, the task is uh, to do solar magnetogram disambiguation and then 
a little bit in more detail about this solar image restoration task. But uh, yeah, first this couple of literature overview studies. So one of them, for instance, is you have uh, this kind of different complexities of sunspots. They are uh, labeled usually manually. So you have here like a unipolar, bipolar, and uh, more complicated. And there are even more categories. They are usually called alpha, beta, and gamma. And uh, then uh, in this particular study, they have used uh, uh, this surface magnetogram as input, passed it through convolutional layers, uh, then some fully connected layers as, as usually, and, and then trained them against these uh, manually labeled uh, letters. I won't go into the results. It's the, I just want to give uh, examples of what people have done with neural networks and what, what is meaningful or, or feasible to do. So next, uh, this kind of question in solar physics is that, how do you know when, uh, when active region uh, flares? Or, because it's, it's quite important uh, uh, to know the flares can cause um, storms in Earth's uh, magnetosphere and, and they can uh, be harmful to us. So it, it is known that uh, they are, the flaring is usually, it's related to magnetic reconnection and, and uh, it depends on the complexity of the, of the active region as well. Uh, and uh, in this particular study, they they have had some uh, layering events uh, as output labels. They they knew where when some flares were observed, and in the input they again used this uh, magnetogram data, passed it through the uh, convolution layers and and so forth, and and trained uh, the network to be able then that to feed in some random uh, active region and uh, then to predict whether wh what is the probability that this uh, active region leads to flaring event, for instance. And next interesting question is, is actually, we would be interested uh, even to predict a couple of days ahead when the active region uh, uh, is formed on, on the surface of the sun. So for the, that purpose, uh, one of my colleagues has um, done a study where they they observed that uh, certain uh, helioseismic uh, modes, uh, in particular F mode, its energy uh, is um, connected to the active region formation. So if you observe certain, there is certain signal in, in this uh, energy of the F mode a couple of days before, even, even before when you start to see the active region on the magnetogram data. So you, you get this data like uh, um, prior couple of days from helioseismic data. And uh, this, this would be also very practical thing to, to know, and what, what would be even better is that in this study they only um, show that this this kind of connection is between, or when you only have a isolated active region, but uh, desire desirable would be to find this connection for the whole disk of the sun. So there, again, deep learning would be definitely needed. Uh, there is no other way of um, like connecting these two quantities uh, to each other because the data is huge and uh, the direct like mathematical model is, is unknown. And uh, quite uh, Quite related to this uh, study is another study where they, based on helioseismic uh, observations, they uh, predict uh, the presence of uh, active regions on the far side 
side of the sun. So before we even start to see them, when they, they rotate them in front of us, so you can already know, know this from the seismic signal. Also, deep learning was used in this uh, paper. So next uh, study, again, done from by one of my colleagues. Uh, on the solar surface, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to estimate, or you, you can uh, get a very um, good uh, estimate of the line of sight velocity of convection cells on the surface of the sun, but, uh, but uh, it's difficult to get um, perpendicular to that direction. There is a way of, of doing this kind of correlation tracking, uh, but this is also, I, I would assume, time consuming. And then uh, in this particular study, they use this kind of hy hybrid method, which is also quite uh, useful nowadays. So where you have, uh, where you first train the tra neural network on simulation data, so you have this continuum in density maps. You you can uh, uh, see the changes in this uh, in the continuum intensity maps, and you uh, relate it to the known horizontal or this um, uh, how how did I call them? Yeah, let's say horizontal velocities, uh, because in the simulations the full uh, data is known. Not, not so in the real observations. And if you have trained the neural network on uh, simulation data, you can later apply it on the uh, observational data because this continuum intensity is observable quantity. And here is a comparison of the neural network result to, the, to this um, correlation tracking result. Yeah. So, very interesting study, in my opinion. And uh, next, uh, just very shortly, uh, this is my ongoing uh, study about uh, vector magnetogram disambiguation. This is also similar to this previous uh, slide in a sense that uh, here the problem is that uh, from Stokes vectors you can uh, get uh, exact uh, line of sight uh, magnetic field value, but but not for this transverse components. So here, here you see that there are these abrupt changes. It, it's just a random, I mean, it, it's, it's nothing physical it, here. It's just the observed quantity has 180 degree disambiguation, uh, I mean, ambiguation there. So the task is to find this uh, field which is the physically most uh, realistic or, or probable. Uh, and uh, for that, we, we have observations. And uh, also for testing purposes, we have have been using Gaussian processes, but also deep learning has uh, uh, it can be very useful there. And now to this main topic, uh, which is uh, solar Im uh, ground based solar image restoration. So here is uh, this kind of schematic representation of what, what, of what happens. So this extended object is, uh, let's say, some kind of surface, um, small surface patch on the yeah, on the solar surface, the light rays pass through turbulent Earth's atmosphere and also the optical system, which has its own aberrations, and then it uh, is recorded in the sensor. And in, uh, and this is done with a high cadence, so we assume that the that the solar uh, the observed object on the solar surface uh, is constant during. Uh, like huge number of frames where you where you what you record 
and we also have uh, the focus here is the beam splitter which uh, uh, leads to the other um, sensor which is defocus uh, defo defo compared to this primary sensor and the uh, idea of that is that you, you basically get more information about the wave from the, you in a sense if you think of uh, uh, taking two two dimensional projections of th three dimensional object or something then you instead of having only <laughs> one projection you have like two so you you obtain more information about it and this regularizes the problem quite a bit i very quickly just go through mathematics because it's a different seminar so it's not maybe so interesting to the listeners but uh, but uh, still so here this d is is then the recorded object and um, recorded object is uh, obtained uh, by when when you convolve the true object uh, with a point spread function and uh, here you assume that uh, the point spread function is constant so it uh, it means that uh, the input uh, image or, or this image patch should be uh, small enough that uh, that you can make this assumption and uh, this last term is uh, then um, photon noise which can often uh, be assumed to be Gaussian although it's Poissonian uh, but if the signal to noise ratio is huge then then the Gaussian assumption is quite good so points but uh, the, the, now the points but function can be uh, expressed via so-called pupil function which uh, depends on on the Phase aberrations, and here the u u is uh, coordinate on the pupil plane. Here here the x plus the coordinate on the image plane, and now the aim is actually to estimate these uh, phase aberrations because these are these are caused by the turbulent atmosphere, and uh, to do that, uh, usually these phase aberrations are. Uh, Expressed as through, uh, let's say, Zernike polynomials or Karpfel and Berg polynomials. The, the latter are a little bit better choice uh, because then the wavefront coefficients become uh, uncorrelated uh, if you assume Olmokorov atmosphere. So here is uh, this kind of um, picture of of how these uh, Zernike polynomials look. So th th this these are low order uh, from top to bottom there are low low order and high order uh, uh, aberrations and and uh, on the right side uh, there is shown the corresponding point spread function when you convert this uh, this wave front to the point point spread function they have very funny names usually coma and uh, and Defoil and so forth, which is remind of certain objects. And uh, now a little bit more about mass. So if if these phase aberrations are, are exactly already known, then the true object can be uh, expressed in a closed form. So uh, and then this object can be fed into the least squares error metric, uh, and uh, then the task itself. Um, will become only uh, you then of the point split function. Yeah, I forgot to mention I, this is now in the Fourier domain. Previously, I, I showed showed the equation which was in the real domain and um, now you have this error metric and optimizing this is very very time consuming 
because it involves Fourier transfer transforms and uh, and uh, it has it is non-linear. So the idea is to use neural networks to do this uh, whole thing. So here again, my colleague has invented uh, a nice uh, neural network structure which which we have been testing. So you feed into the input these uh, pairs of focused and defocused um, uh, images, which I showed on the first uh, uh, picture. And then uh, from, from top to bottom, there is, you can assume this is like a time axis here. So these are like frames on consecutive time steps. And each pair of frame is passed through uh, these convolutional uh, layers with uh, this um, pass-through connections, which makes training faster. Uh, then uh, in, in some internal layer, you learn some, so to say, latent features. You, you assume that it's a, some kind of low dimensional representation of, of now this wave front. And, uh, as, as now the, you can expect that neighboring uh, wave fronts or earth atmosphere wave fronts are uh, correlated to each other, then it's very good idea to pass them, to, pass them through a long short term memory, which is uh, proved to be very efficient in, in uh, kind of time series uh, tasks. Here you pass it once through in one direction, then in the other direction, and uh, and then the results are again passed through some fully connected layers uh, to obtain these uh, wavefront coefficients here. And and now if you apply these transforms in the previous equation, to what I showed, then you can convert them to based on this wavefront uh, coefficients, you can calculate the optical transfer function and calculate this loss, loss uh, which I showed in previous slides. So, uh, so this makes this uh, full idea like uh, unsupervised learning. I mean, in, in principle, you could uh, also use, uh, let's say, simulation data or, or then data from already restored, uh, like data of already restored images. Uh, but here, this idea doesn't rely on any any knowledge about clean images. It, it's fully like um, this uh, theoretical model, which I previously showed, is uh, fully captured in, in this um, neural network structure here. And uh, now, a little, little bit about the obtained results. They are this kind of early results. Uh, we are using uh, my high, uh, data in Europe, European Solar Telescope, uh, where I have uh, generated training data of 10,000 small uh, isoplanetic patches of size 60. Uh, 96 times 96 pixels, and uh, and then uh, using 30 frames uh, for each, is consecutive frames, atmospheric frames, and now the uh, number of convolution layers in the first layer was 32. In, 32 in this particular example. Uh, the long short term memory state vector was of size 128, uh, and we are using uh, this kind of um, GPU. And there, the training takes uh, approximately 15, for this data set, it takes like 15 minutes uh, per one epoch, but uh, usually you need tens of epochs until convergence. But now on uh, test time, when you feed through the 
unknown, unknown uh, aberrated image, then, then the restoration is very fast, like uh, five seconds for these 32 frames, for instance. If you increase the number of frames, which makes should make the result better, then of course the time also increases. Now I show just, uh, okay, it's quite slow actually. I, I wanted to, ah, it's maybe a little bit seen. I wanted to flicker between two atmospheric frames to show you how the image changes uh, between two time steps. So it, it is, you can see this kind of uh, wobbling of the granules. So these are raw images with some pre-processing of course. And now the results. So on this left column, uh, have shown the state of dark method, method results and on the middle column now the results for this trained neural network and on the right side you could ignore this outer edge here uh, because apparently the I, I will first tell you what the colors mean the red basically means that for this particular small patch the neural network uh, outperformed uh, in restoration the state of the art code and and the blue means that uh, is it's vice versa uh, but uh, yeah this outer edge should be should be disregarded because uh, this state of the art method has uh, its own uh, problems there uh, so only the inter internal part uh, is meaningful to compare so here we still see that it, it's uh, more to bias towards the blue one. Uh, so it means that the error metric uh, remained still in all cases, in all, for all of these patches, a little bit higher than the, for the state of the art method. So it, it, we are not quite yet there with this um, study. We, we would want to get, equally good results or, or even even better but visually it's the clean images look quite good already and here are the, these learned wafer co coefficients we see that there are differences between the red curve is the output from neural network and the blue curve from the state of the art method so there are definitely some unanswered questions here why the neural network coefficients, the time series of these are much uh, smoother, for instance, very much less. Here are the corresponding uh, comparison of point spread functions and, and uh, the wave fronts of the atmosphere. Also, quite big differences to actually. Here is the comparison of the power spectrum of the restored objects. Here, actually, the this green and the blue, uh, green and um, red curves, they match quite, quite uh, well. So it is some indication that that the neural network does its job quite well. But still, we have open questions. So as I mentioned, neural network is still worse than the state of the art method. And um, this is uh, obviously because this wavefront coefficients that are learned are, are for some reason varying much less from frame to frame. I have not come up with the answer to that yet. Why is it so? Is it because the size of the training data or complexity of the network or, or topology of the network? This is difficult to say at the moment. So neural network doesn't seem to generalize to worse atmosphere so well. Well, here I only showed quite good result, but for more turbulent atmospheres, it, the results are worse. So we have some future directions to try out um, different architectures. 
which my colleague um, has already really proposed and they seem to perform better. And now to the conclusions of this talk. Uh, so every day new, practically every day, some new machine learning study comes out uh, and uh, yeah, the, the more time goes on, the more studies using deep learning are published. Primarily supervised learning is used. However, it's, uh, it's in some cases unsuitable to use it because it needs lots of manual labor to, to produce the labeled data. Uh, then deep learning itself is very efficient way of, of learning uh, very complicated dependencies between different variables uh, and this dependency is mathematically unknown for instance but it lo uh, requires lots of training the data and and it's usually slow to train but at this time it's it's uh, very fast uh, of course here uh, it, it's um, mostly the advantage of using GPUs, for instance, uh, what makes it fast. And uh, then usually at least time, speed-wise, uh, neural networks outperform other me methods, uh, sometimes even by orders of magnitude. So it's, it's very useful to use them if you are time-restricted, you have some kind of time-restricted application where you your data is uh, flowing in in a in a such a fast pace that you need to do the transformation very quickly and you let's say are unable to store it uh, or or whatever other restrictions can be there yeah and uh, this is list of the references or the papers uh, used here. So now this is the end of my presentation, basically. Does anybody have questions or comments or uh, maybe discussion? It is possible to type into public chat the questions also. Ja kes soovib, võib ka eesti keeles küsida. Uh, can you specify? Uh, what do you mean exactly by review? Ah, retrain. Yeah, uh, this is of course, um, uh, currently we have uh, only applied this uh, method on uh, data from single day. So it's, um, it, it, we, we, are, we have not tested it in a, situation where you for instance train it on on the data based on observations on one day and then test it on on another day but um, the earth's atmosphere i mean yeah the, the seeing conditions can vary of course from day to day and also it depends on the altitude of the sun and the other all kinds of other factors so it's um, yeah it's a very good question <laughs> uh, how frequently you have to retrain but i i would say that if, if you would because e even the data set of one day is already so huge that with this uh, state of the art method it, it would be unfeasible to do the restoration for, for all the frames it's, it's just impossible but uh, i would say that if if you would train the neural network for each day separately because training Definitely takes less than one day, then, 
I mean, in principle, uh, if the method doesn't generalize uh, over the days that you have to do it, uh, uh, like the features on the sun uh, chains that neural network has never seen, for instance, and uh, uh, if such things um, determine the outcome of the network, then uh, even if you train it once a day and then apply it for for the data of the single day, then then it would be usable. But it's it's hard to say. We have not uh, we have not um, looked into these details much yet. Anything else? Maybe some questions with to the regarding the connection to remote sensing or something. Um, if if there are some uh, ideas or, or where where to use deep learning. There is one question about which uh, software do you usually use for machine learning? Ah, yeah, I, I me forgot to mention, yeah, the, usually these deep learning applications are done in Python. There are several libraries there. Most maybe frequently used nowadays is PyTorch. It's quite flexible and it has all these built-in uh, components like this um, long short memory and all these uh, convolutional layers and um, yeah so it's it's in python uh, of course there are also c++ libraries available python is maybe the most easiest to use it doesn't need so much maybe background knowledge even of deep learning if you take some example from the internet and uh, and try to like reproduce the results yourself and uh, and it's uh, possible to learn but but yeah with these big data sets gpus are are inevitable because without the use of gpu this training would be so slow that um, yeah, it, it it's it is possible, but but you wouldn't like benefit so much anymore. You you just lose so much time for fine tuning the these parameters of the neural network and its topology. And you every time you make some change, you need to run it again, and you want it to be quite fast to see. Uh, where the how the chains affected the learning process because yeah one of these parameters for instance is is the learning rate uh, then you want to decide uh, how many convolutional uh, kernels you have then what else yeah basically how many neurons you have in these internal layers and uh, yeah, what kind of activation functions to use, for instance. Uh, mm, yeah, there are lots of things to fine tune there, and uh, you want it to be fast for that purpose. I, I 
didn't see one question uh, before because the scroll bar went down, yeah. Uh, so now the other question. Oh yeah, it's also a good question. Why not more than one deep purpose plane, but uh, people have tried it out with other, I mean, it cannot, it, it can be any kind of uh, phase aberration. It, like a known phase aberration, not necessarily deep focus, but uh, some studies or experiments have shown that uh, there is not any more major benefit of adding more uh, these um, deep focus planes there. The, the primary I need for this deep focus plane is that uh, there is this kind of um, uh, the, the same wavefront can, can lead to different uh, uh, point spread functions, and th there is no uniqueness there. But if you if you add this D focus um, image there, then you then you get uh, then then already the problem regularizes much more, so that the same wavefront cannot uh, cannot um, produce like a uh, like a two different wavefronts cannot produce the same point spread function and at the same time similar uh, defocused point spread function. So the, the uniqueness uh, is much higher there. But somehow we are still having some unexplained uh, issues what comes to neural networks in that regard. We don't understand why it. Uh, it basically it should work better. This defocus should make the learning process much much better than it currently is. So we are having some unanswered questions there. Ah, the ne neural network package is uh, called PyTorch. So it's uh, it it uh, not only neural network. Uh, package, but uh, you can do any kind of uh, matrix al algebra there, uh, and especially it's very easy to uh, adapt it to GPU usage on so just like changing one line of code basically or something like that. And um, yeah, it, it has, um, it has Fourier transforms everything there, so uh, this library is quite big. And the other uh, frequently used library is also TensorFlow. Nowadays, maybe less popular uh, because it's it's somewhat less flex flexible. It's it's maybe TensorFlow. Uh, it it contains this. Uh, other library called Keras, which which was first uh, like totally independent, but then it was was uh, was merged under TensorFlow, and this Keras especially is uh, maybe easiest to learn for for the newcomers who are not so familiar with uh, or neural networks and uh, yeah and. Um, I, I have used both of these libraries. Any more questions? I guess I will stop recording only and then we can continue the questions. Still. Now we are recording again. So, neural network uh, in a nutshell is, is uh, such a transform. X is an input of I here. Ident identifies the basically the index of the layer uh, and uh, x is input it, it is a matrix multiplication with this uh, 
neural network weights, or usually this is, is called the neuron, neurons, let's say. And then it's passed through nonlinear function to, to get more flexibility, because with only linear transforms, you are not able to do much. And, and why is the output of, of this layer I? And, and there is a theorem uh, that, that ha has shown that any continuous function can be approximated up to any precision with sufficiently deep or, or also wide network, but deep networks are much more uh, perform better, so people don't use wide networks. Yeah, and the training of the network is uh, based on the, in the output you have, um, if you have ground truth data, or in my case, I had this uh, well-defined error metric. Uh, if you have the loss function, so to say, then you can, um, if you feed through the data, through the network, the data, then you calculate the loss compared to the ground truth and uh, you propagate uh, this error uh, to the back to the weights of, of the neurons in each layer. So this is this famous back propagation algorithm. And uh, there is a nice online book called deeplearningbook.org where all the theory is quite well explained. Yeah, here is uh, now another uh, schematic representation of of the neural network. So th this is now the single layer. The, the X1, 2, 3 are, are the input variables. The, the whole thing itself is input vector. Then it's uh, multiplied with these weights. This is this matrix multiplication, basically, and pass through this uh, nonlinear function to get the output. And here it, it uh, shows multiple layers. And uh, you see that the num number of neurons in each layer can be different. And also the nonlinear function used can be different. Yeah, but these kind of fully connected layers where you have this kind of connection from each output to the uh, each input of the next layer, this is scale very poorly. Uh, and, and also for deep networks, there is a known gradient vanishing problem uh, for which, which can be alleviated by using this famous um, ReLU maybe even the most uh, frequently used uh, uh, activation functions, for instance. And also these pass-through connection, uh, pass connections I showed in um, my diagram, th these also alleviate this vanishing problem. I think if I'm correct, now I must rethink. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, and the correct initialization of the weights is, is important, but all these libraries have, have these initialization routines and one doesn't have to invent the wheel there. But uh, yeah, to make the neural network learning or training uh, efficient, then instead of fully connected layers, uh, especially with image data and where the input is already quite uh, weak, or uh, then you use these convolutional layers, which were inspired uh, by visual cortex in the brain. And, and here it's basically, you, 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 you share the weights because the kernel of the, um, kernel of the convolution is much smaller. You, you share the weights across inputs and you basically use, um, many uh, convolutional layers. So in each, each layer, the network then learns different uh, weights for these convolutional kernels. And then, uh, then uh, from layer to layer, it's usually so that uh, on the first layer, it um, this different, uh, and now I'm referring to 
uh, two different things. One is the convolutional. Uh, sorry, these are uh, called let's let's call them channels. Then uh, each each uh, channel learns some kind of uh, feature in in the first layer after the input. It usually uh, learns this kind of simple features like some kind of edges or 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 corners. Then if you go layer deeper, then then you do usually this pooling also. You you uh, basically downsample the data, but then you increase the convolutional uh, channels uh, for the next layer. So basically the amount of information remains almost the same, but uh, you, you want to make the image or, or, the, or the input for the next layer smaller and smaller. So the more down you go in this um, hierarchy, the more abstract features the network learns. So let's say on, on some layer it learns such features like eyes or noses and, and, and on this output layer, let's say it, it's already it's able to distinguish very abstract things like different faces of the uh, people. And uh, yeah, th this is uh, usually the yeah, and and uh, after after the convolutional layers are uh, applied, then usually you have a couple of fully connected layers there, and uh, in this particular example here you in the output you have then like uh, four neurons which first uh, f first like um, represents cats uh, dogs second cat uh, fourth goat and the uh, third goat and fourth uh, bird so then you rep um, you interpret this uh, Neurons so that that it's a probability of of the output being a bird, both cat or dog, and um, that's usually how this kind of image-based um, training is always done. There are some differences uh, in each particular case, but uh, but this is the general pattern always used and uh, and uh, from internet i think it's quite easy to find some working or um, reasonable architecture already uh, which you then uh, need to maybe change quite quite a li only a little bit uh, to make it work for your own particular problem but of course the problems uh, get more complicated and complicated over time because uh, the domain domain of, of deep learning application expands <laughs> so the more maybe more difficult to answer more difficult questions so this trivial case is maybe not um, yeah this trivial case you can download from the internet and just run it but but that's not so for, for maybe different tasks in remote sensing. Definitely not so. And and of course the pitfall is usually that whether you have these um, output labels, do you do you have manually like. Um, label data already available or not if not then you have to think in terms of how how can you convert your problem to the to unsupervised learning so how how would you because then you are able to it's still possible to able to learn the different classes let's say but uh, for instance, then uh, you definitely don't know which class represents the dog, which one the cat, for instance. Then this kind of manu manual 
labeling should be done after that. But of course, unsupervised learning is already, uh, it's not anymore so straightforward. And I would say that it's much harder to get uh, maybe results that you would be expecting. And uh, in my particular case, I, the, why is it, why, why we can do it in that manner is that we, we had full mathematical model available, but like learning to recognize faces, for instance, or like uh, convert hand-drawn uh, faces to like uh, paintings or, or like, uh, hand, like, let's say convert uh, paintings to photos or, or tasks like that. There, you don't have any mathematical model, of course, behind that. Then, then the trick is to build up with such a neural network structure, which you can still train in that um, context. So it's, it needs lots of vision. But uh, I think lots of papers in the internet are also available to, to get some ideas from in to be able to maybe see in which way one or another task can be can be solved using deep learning yeah so uh, this was this was my last slide about neural networks <laughs> Thank you. It was very, very good and informative. And definitely, uh, neural networks are very important for for remote sensing at all kind of different scales. Yeah, I, I would see that they they are way of optimizing. If you already have some method to do something, then. One way of thinking is that neural networks can always optimize the task and but sometimes of course they can solve certain problems that cannot be done with any other method because of this unknown dependency between variables which you cannot mathematically formulate. So yeah, there is lots of potential in it. So does anybody from the audience has some questions still? If not, then I guess we can finish the seminar. <laughs> <laughs>